Thank you, Hampton. But since we're few and far between this morning, I'm going to get down here with you. <laughs> Do remember those traveling, those who are sick. We know, as we say, it is the season for various ailments, colds, flu, and all that. So take care of yourself and pray for those uh, who are sick. And maybe you can uh, minister to them in some way. Joseph number two. A brief recap, as we usually do, talking about Joseph from the Old Testament, the son of Jacob's old age. Rachel was his mother, and Rachel was Jacob's true love. Jacob favored him, gave him that coat of many colors, as we say, very colored coat. Jacob let him be, if you will, the eyes and ears for him. Uh, and he had watched his brothers taking care of the herd, the flocks. And his brothers weren't doing a good job, and so he brought back a bad report about them. Also, Joseph had two dreams. They were prophetic dreams that one day his brothers would bow down to him, and then another one, and even his parents would bow down to him. And that created all of this, created a lot of hatred and jealousy in his brothers, if you recall. And so uh, one time... Joseph was sent out by his father to check on them. They were shepherding the flock, and they saw him coming. And the hatred had gotten so bad that they said well, they were going to kill him. Reuben intervened, and they ended up throwing him in the pit and then selling him as a slave to some Ishmaelite traders. And then they took his tunic, put some blood from a goat on it, took it to the father and said, is this your son's tunic? And made the ruse, really told a lie. Jacob thought his beloved son was dead, and he mourned for him greatly. Through no fault of his own, Joseph became a slave in a foreign country. But God was with him. And I'd ask Hampton to lead the song about amazing grace. And this was God's grace that was with Joseph through all of this time. And in fact, God was using Joseph for good. He was moving him through all these various stages. And even as we read last time, he was being tested and refined. And we kind of are directing this lesson to all you young folks out there. For us to understand that life isn't always fair, that there are many ups and downs, twists and turns. Things will happen that will be good, and things will happen that will be bad through no fault of your own. And you just have to kind of, as we say, roll with the punches and understand God is still with you. He's going to bring you through it, and there will be good to happen on the other side. So let's go to Genesis 39 and see what transpires here with Joseph as a slave in Egypt, you know, separated now from his whole family, uh, feeling the wrath of his brothers, probably wondering what was that all about, why am I here? Genesis 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You know, uh, I often ask these kinds of questions because these these people were real people. They were human beings. They had dreams. They had fears. They had plans and all that. 
What, what must have been going through Joseph's mind as he was being carried with the, by the Ishmaelites down to Egypt? Did he think about escaping? Did he try to escape? You know, we don't have any of that. You know, surely he must have had a lot of questions about, you know, what is going on here? Why is this happening to me as we often? Anybody ever say that? Why is this happening to me? Yeah. No? Nobody? Just one. Hampton, you're the only honest person here. Yes. The fact that Potiphar bought Joseph is God's hand at work. Potiphar being this high Egyptian official. And if you know the story, you know, God is trying to get Joseph close to the Pharaoh. Because he has a plan. He knows the future. And him, Joseph is going to help save his family from the coming famine. So he is, in fact, the captain of the bodyguard of Pharaoh. So he's really close to Pharaoh. He knows the ins and outs of the whole palace and all that. And so uh, Joseph uh, was bought by Potiphar. The Lord was with Joseph, blessing his work. Uh, it says he became a successful man or a prosperous man. Um, he would have had to have worked to have done that. He was a slave, obviously. If a slave didn't work, they paid for it. So we know, kind of know the character of Joseph, that he was a good, honest young man. And so he would have applied himself, even though he was a slave, and God blessed the work of his hands. Uh, even though he was a slave to Potiphar, he was still a servant of the Lord, wasn't he? He was a servant of the Lord first. He was living, if you will, in two worlds, which we are, right? If you're a Christian, we're living in two worlds. Our citizenship is in heaven. Jesus Christ is our master first and foremost, the Lord of all. But we also in this country in this world, and we even studied a little bit about that in our Bible class last time. God has, in fact, established the powers that be, the governments, to control right and wrong, the evildoers, and so we're to listen to what they say as long as it doesn't conflict with the Lord's word, and we're to pay taxes and honor those who deserve honor and so forth and so on, which we try our best to do. Let's go to verse 3. Now his master, meaning Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. Wow. Here's, you know, sold into Egypt as a slave, but... David, I'm sorry, not David, Joseph applies himself. He applies himself. He works hard, and God is with him. We don't see or hear about Joseph whining or griping or trying to get out of the work. Okay? And Potiphar credits the Lord with blessing Joseph, who in turn, it was a blessing on Potiphar's estate and Potiphar's house. You know, back in the day, all these various countries, they knew about their gods. You know, there were different gods for the Philistines, there were different gods for the Egyptians, there were different gods for the Assyrians. Of course, the Israelites served the true and the living God, the Lord God. So Potiphar is seeing that Joseph's God, you know, whether, I'm not sure Potiphar actually believed in the Lord God, but he is crediting the Lord God with blessing Joseph and as subsequently blessing Potiphar's house. Everything's going good for Potiphar because of Joseph. So uh, he becomes his personal servant and, and overseer of everything. That's amazing. And, and this was uh, 
Well, let's read two more verses. I'm getting ahead of myself. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Wow. Joseph was blessed, so Potiphar was blessed, and everything was blessed. Everything was going well. You know, whatever crops he had, it says, in the field, in the house. Uh, we don't know. Maybe he had, you know, a lot of people lived hand to mouth in those days a lot. They grew their own crops and so forth. So he is truly blessed. And from this, I, I want us to go to 1 Corinthians 7. We ought to see that God is not stingy, all right? God is very gracious, and he blesses people. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is talking about marriage and, uh, to some extent, mixed marriages. In 1 Corinthians 7, 12, Paul says, but to the rest I say not to the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever. So we have a husband who is a Christian and a, and a wife who is not. And she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Same thing, okay? For, now here's 14, and here's, here's our focus. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. So he's not saying that the unbelieving husband or unbelieving wife is saved. That's not what he's saying. They are sanctified or they are set apart in God's eyes. And because of the believing husband or the believing wife, the unbeliever is blessed and so are those children in that house because there's one Christian there. The whole household is sanctified and set apart in God's eyes. There's a Christian living there. I'm going to pay special attention to that household. Because one of mine is there. That's a marvelous thing. If we read another place where we know God sends his rain on the just and the unjust, you know, the sun bears the crops in the field for the good as well as the bad. God wants to bless people, and that's part of his drawing. Said one scripture said, The goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God. We have to remember that that he is a good God and he wants to bless people. So all of Potiphar's estate is prospering here. He grew to trust Joseph. He puts everything in Joseph's hands except the food that he eats. He said, I want to pick that out myself. So Joseph was in a great place. Joseph is doing very well for himself as a slave in Egypt. He has, I'm sure, if you... We remember, right, where does it say he was in the house? One of those verses there. Anyway, it says he was in the house. I mean, he wasn't living outside somewhere. He was actually in this house. Now, it was probably a pretty big house, but he was in the house. He was in charge of the house. He had food, clothing, and shelter. He had prestige. He had authority. He was running everything. But remember, he was a Hebrew. He was an outsider. Okay? And that's going to come to play here in just a minute. Verse 7. It came about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to finish verse 6 here because this leads into the next part. It says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Everybody wants to be good looking, right? Have a nice physique. Yeah, take care of yourself. Look good for a little girl, a little boy, your friend, right? 
You want to do that? That's okay. But beware. Because you might attract some unsavory people. <laughs> See someone shaking their head. Just beware. It was interesting as I was reading this. The very same words were written previously in Genesis about Joseph's mother, Rachel. She was good looking in form and the face. I thought that was really interesting because Joseph is her son. So he took on the characteristics there of his mother, Rachel. All right, let's look at verse 7. It came about after these events. Joseph's in good position here. He's in charge. Everything's going good. Potiphar's being blessed. That his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and said, lie with me. Wow. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I. Look at that. I'm the main guy. Potiphar is totally trusting Joseph. And he should have, as we, as we know and we see. And he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Wow. Joseph's character really comes into display, on display here. You know, he, he's got all this authority. He's in charge. He's good looking, got a nice physique. And to, to the point that his master's wife wants him sexually? Wow. But he says, I'm not going to do it. And his first thought says, if I did that, I would sin against God. Good for him. And that should be, always be our first thought in any situation we are being tempted about God or about the Lord Jesus. If I do this, will it bring honor to his name or dishonor? What would he think? You remember this old WWJD several years ago, what would Jesus do? Well, yeah, that could, that could fit in. But his character comes out, you know. Joseph is just an amazing young man. Joseph was around, you know, we're going to talk about the situation a little bit here. Joseph was in the house. He was in charge of everything. All the other servants, all the other slaves, he was around a lot. Potiphar may not have been around a lot. Being an officer of Pharaoh, had to have been down at the palace a lot, you know what I mean? Not there maybe every day. So maybe the wife is just getting bored, you know, looking around. It happens. It happens. Talking about the situation. Not only would Joseph have sinned against God, he would have sinned against Potiphar as well. Because it was Potiphar's wife. And she would, he would have sinned against her. And he would have sinned against his own self by doing that. Sin is multifaceted. Verse 10, let's look at 10. As he spoke to Joseph, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. She is unrelenting, and a lot of temptations are unrelenting, and we were talking about that in our Bible class this morning. If you have a situation where you need to flee and get out of it, you need to get out of it. Now, Joseph was kind of confined here, and he couldn't do much because he's a slave. But if you've got a situation where someone is tempting you or a situation is tempting you, you shouldn't 
try, if you go to somebody's house or into this establishment and you start getting tempted, you need to stop. <laughs> stop going into that place or stop being around that person if they're always trying to get you to do something that's wrong. Was it just her desire for him? Perhaps it was. He said, we just read he was attractive. Maybe she wanted to dominate him. You know, you, you, you got all this authority, but I'm his wife. You should lie with me. I, you know, some temptations are relentless, and we have to be aware of that. Verse 11, now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of them in the household were there inside. And this is, again, situations where you have to be careful. Not only older for all you younger folks, older folks as well, when you are alone with somebody, beware. It can happen. You know, whether it be something like this or whether the other person says, why don't we uh, go down to the uh, convenient and, uh, you know, do a little shoplifting and rip off some candy bars and whatever. Yeah, okay, let's go do that. Beware of who you're with and being alone. I'm not saying it always happened, but it can happen. You, you just beware. Joseph sets a great example for us here. None of the men in the household were inside. Verse 12, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. He took off. Flee. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, flee immorality, flee sexual immorality. Get out of there. Don't hang around when you have that kind of a problem. Of course, this, this snowballs on Joseph here, but he did the right thing. He got out of there. He said, no way, not going to do it. Verse 13, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside. She called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his gar he left his garment she left his garment, excuse me, beside her until his master came home. You know, the old quote, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And that's exactly what happened here. Yeah. All of a sudden it turned. He said no, and he finally said no, and she said, okay, I'm going to get you. Beware. It can happen. It can happen. This, you know, this goes to under, trying to understand who you hang out with, who you make friends with. Are they good people, people of integrity? I'm not saying everybody's a Christian, but are they honest and upright? Or, you know, do they have that side that they're always thinking about doing something that you shouldn't? Notice the three things that she says here to defend herself, so to speak. First of all, she even accuses her husband. He, when, he, when she says there, he, verse 14, he has brought in a Hebrew. That's my husband. That's his fault. He brought this guy in here. Secondly, it was this. He was a Hebrew. He's not one of us. What could we expect? You know, I don't know if this is one of the earliest examples of anti-Semitism or not, but, you know, she's pointing that out. He's not one of us, you know. Oh, oh, that politics of division, you know. They're not in the same group, so you can't be good. And then it was to make sport of us, you know. Here, you know, whether she's saying, you know, Joseph was put in, uh, had authority over everything. So maybe, you know, that was probably bothering her. 
that he being a Hebrew was over everybody and, and that he was kind of thinking, hey, I'm, I'm better than all you Egyptians here, you know. I, I got this whole place running correctly, you know. It's, it's all about me. I don't know if she knew him or not that much. But anyway, that's what she says. He's in here to just make, he's making sport of us. He thinks he can do anything he wants. You know, she was defending herself, making these things up. Verse 17. Then she spoke to him, that's Potiphar, with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to, to him saying, this is what your slave did to me. There's the old, your slave is this, your son's tunic. You know, that's always the thing. Lay it back on the other person. His anger burned. We'll talk about that in a minute. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. Potiphar got angry. Now, we immediately would think he got angry at Joseph. And he may well have got angry at Joseph. He probably did, perhaps until he thought the whole thing through. Because we know that over time, and this, you know, this wouldn't have taken two weeks. This whole episode here would have taken several months, if not a couple of years, for Joseph to get into this position, for Potiphar to learn to trust him, for Potiphar to know him, and you know, all of that. So when he hears this about Joseph, it might be, that doesn't ring true, because I, I know my slave. Maybe he was even partially angry with his, maybe he knew his wife. You know, we're just kind of thinking out, outside the box here a little bit. But he had to do something, right? He had to take his wife's side. So he put the Another argument here, from the standpoint of maybe he didn't fully believe the report, is where he put Joseph. And just the fact that he put him in jail, that he didn't have him beaten, you know? I mean, he was a slave. I think if Potiphar really thought Joseph had done this, there would have been a very severe retribution on him. But he puts him in jail. And not only does he put him in jail, but he puts him in a place where the king's prisoners were kept. So that would not have been the worst jail or prison in the whole country. You know, these prisoners would have been probably pretty well taken care of, kind of like our white collar prison, you know, we have today. So, you know, it makes you think that Potiphar's maybe not buying this whole thing. And of course, again, God's hand is in this. God's hand is in this as we see this unfolds. Again, this is going to get Joseph close to Pharaoh. Anyway, Joseph gets railroaded again for nothing he did. So we saw that in the first story. Just being a good son, doing what his father asked, his brothers wanted to kill him, sold him into slavery. Now he's doing what his master asked him to do, taking care of the house, everything's prospering. And now because of what the wife does, he gets thrown into jail. Again, nothing he did wrong. So again, it's a lesson for us. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes somebody might say, tell a lie about us. And that lie is believed, no matter what we say or do. And, you know, we get kicked off the cast for the play, or we don't get to do what we want to do. We lose a 
place in the honor society because somebody lied about us, whatever. It can happen. Just beware. Be ready. Don't quit. Don't have a meltdown. God will be with you. Just stay the course. Notice here as we finish this out, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. He's always with his people. No matter how dark it is, no matter what happens, he's always with you. And, and you don't know where he's taking you or what he wants you to learn from a situation. And extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. That favor, again, is grace. Grace. The chief jailer committed to Joseph charge all the prisoners who were in the jail. So that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. Does this sound familiar? Joseph hung in there and God blessed him. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. God continued to work. And, of course, we know God was behind it all because God had a plan. God was using Joseph for something really good and great. I don't think Joseph understood it all, but he remained true to himself, true to God, and God was with him, and God blessed him. Joseph was an amazing young man whom we can all learn from. So as we close this out, and Lord willing, we're going to get into chapter 40 the next time. Joseph had his ups and downs. Seriously? Duh. He did. This is twice now. Doing great. Got hammered for nothing he did wrong. But whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper, and he's a great example for us. Beware of the evil that's around be true to yourself, be true to God, and he will bring you through whatever you're going through at the time. God bless you, and Lord willing, we'll look forward to more about Joseph next time.